Uh, if, if I was going to give a title to this, I think I'd like to call it um, My Before and After. I've got a couple of, th three images possibly to pop up. Um, if, the, if the first one <coughs> can come up, if this is going to, this is going to work. Um, so My Before and, and After. And it was, and it's just looking. All oh right, this is um, this is from uh, Andy Warhol. It's called my called before and after, and um, <coughs> we'll perhaps mention it a little bit in a minute. Um, so, what was he like before? What was, what was Saul's before? He's mentioned three times in Acts, and it's all sort of with views of sort of in uh, in this passage. Uh, up until this point, he's been mentioned a few times, and he's always um, persecuting the, ch the, the church. And it says, um, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out. Uh, what I've done is I've put together a string, because it, the story of Paul's conversion is repeated three times in Acts. Acts 9, 22, and 26. And you get different snippets from each one, so I've sort of pulled them together. Um, so... Uh, it says uh, he was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord, Lord's disciples, which we've just read. And then Acts 22, it says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia and brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. And in Acts 26, he says, I too was convinced I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that, in just, and that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. And now those sort of references towards his, his, his antagonism towards Christians. But on the other side of the coin, if you like, religiously, he was really privileged and very diligent. And in Philippians 3, 4, he says, If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gain to me, I now consider loss. For the sake of for the sake of Christ, so we have a, an image here of a very religious, devout, focused young young man, well ed, well educated, and convinced that the Christians have have got it have got it wrong, and he's doing all he can to per, to persecute them. In Acts eight three, it says, "But Paul began to destroy the church, going from house to house." He dragged off both men and women. And the word destroy is only used in the New Testament there. In, in Psalm 80, 13, it is used of wild boars devastating a vineyard. It says, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God. Uh, Galatians 1, 30. Persecuted has been translated as mauled, a ravaging of a body, by a wild beast. And in Acts 9, meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats, an allusion to the panting and the snorting of wild beasts. So if you put that, you get this, this, this uh, image of Saul coming out really angry and, and aggressive and, and nasty. And God was going to touch his life. It's absolutely, it's absolutely amazing. Calvin said, um, not only is such a cruel wolf being turned into a sheep, but he's also assuming the character of a shepherd. And so this, and this is what I wanted to use the pick for, it was no superficial transformation. We can transform ourselves possibly physically, 
as in, uh, as in Andy Warhol's uh, screen, and Andy Warhol's screen print, we might be able to change ourselves superficially, but this was a fundamental change in, in Saul's life. He was going to be changed from top to bottom. He would refer to it as being as changing from death to life, from darkness to light. And God is able to transform, to transform such, such a life. Saul's conversion is mentioned three times in Acts, as, as we said, and it's sort of interesting uh, when things are repeated. And I think it's repeated three times <clears throat> to show us how important it is. The, later on in the book of Acts, I think you're doing it shortly, um, Cornelius is converted. And he is, he, and Peter, the, Gent the gospel goes to the Gentiles. So that's a huge step. But Cornelius' conversion is, spo is spoken of twice in Acts. And it, again, get lengthy accounts. And the same with Paul, they are lengthy accounts. They're not just allusions to it. In Acts 22 and 26, when Paul's giving his, his, tes his testimony, they're, they're, qu they're quite lengthy. But three times, it, it's, it's, it's going to be so important. Paul would become one of the most important Christians, if you like, um, through, the, through the grace of God. This is what David Pawson says of him. He was the first writer in the Bible to state the gospel in a straightforward way. Actually, he says he thought he was the only writer in the New Testament to state it in a straightforward way. It's, inter it's interesting. Um, his letter to the Romans has been more influential in Christian history than any other writing. It was the third chapter of that letter that changed Augustine's life. It was the fifth chapter that changed Martin Luther's life. And it was the eighth chapter that changed John Wesley's life. And it all began on the road to Damascus. It was such an influential uh, event. If you put the account of the encounter together, you could read. You could put it. It would read something like, "At about noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. I fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord?' I asked. "'I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting.' I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, "'Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? "'It's hard for you to kick against the goads. "'Now get up and go into the city "'and you'll be told what you must do.' "'My companions saw the light, "'but they did not understand the voice of him "'who was speaking to me. "'What shall I do, Lord?' I asked. "'Get up,' the Lord said, "'and go into Damascus. "'There you will be told all that has been assigned to do.' My companions led me by the hand in Damascus because of the brilliance of the light had, had, blind, had blinded me. And so he's on his way to Damascus. Damascus um, had about 30 to 40 synagogues. It was a large Jewish um, population in Damascus. And he thought that some Christians would be, would be found there. And so he had left, he'd left Jerusalem to go to Damascus with a view to rounding up the Christians and bringing them back to Jerusalem to, f to, f to face trial. Do perhaps we could have the... Oh, excellent. That's a <laughs> I, I love a map. Don't you love a map? Now, now this, one would, <laughs> this one is, is fine. The, Jeru the journey is about 150 miles, takes about a, a week. <clears throat> but the... Int but I've, I've been really intrigued by, and I don't have the answers to it, but it says, as we neared Damascus. And so you can see from, from this map that when you near, as you get near Damascus, you've left Israel and you've come into Syria. And that was the point that Paul had left Israel and God appeared to him once he was outside of Israel. That's in, that is interesting. Aren't you fine? If you go back to Stephen's preach, I think you did it a, a week or so ago, when, when, when Stephen's preached, he, and uh, it says um, in, in 7.2, Brothers and 
Fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia. In verse 30, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. And in 744, our ancestors had the tabernacle of the covenant law with them in the wilderness. It remained in the hand until the time of David, who obeyed God's favour and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things, you stiff-necked people? Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. And so... <clears throat> What was Stephen sort of saying in, in, in his... One of the things he was saying is, look, you think you've got God sorted out. You've got your temple. You think you've got God positioned in your temple and, and all of your mindset is, 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 around, is around that. But just look. Actually, God appeared to Abraham before he got to Israel. He appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia. He appeared to Moses in Egypt. In fact, God didn't want to live in a temple. He was happier in a tent because he was, move, he was moving with his people. And so he was telling them somehow they'd got something fundamentally wrong in their mindset about God. <clears throat> and, and I don't really, and I just throw this out to, to think about because I don't really know the answers. But it's just so, it's so fascinating that this mindset that would have been Paul's mindset that now he stepped outside of Israel, Jesus appears to him. And, and it's just sort of, wow, that's going to, that's going to change everything, isn't it? Whatever he had thought, that, that they, they thought they got God sealed up, they got him in his house, he was at the centre of the, the country and everything. But God, but God wasn't like that. And Paul was going to take the gospel, uh, he was going to be the greatest missionary, and take the gospel to as far around the world as he, could, as he could go. And so something needed to happen to his thinking. And I also like to think of this, that he reflected on, C on Stephen's sermon, and things started to come together. Because you do like to think that sermons aren't just a waste of breath, don't you? <laughs> I like to think that. I like to think that it has some sort of impact on people's life. And people think, oh yeah, what was Stephen getting at? Because Paul was going to need a total change of mindset. <clears throat> and part of that was that as he stepped outside, as he stepped outside of Israel, God appeared to him. Jesus made himself known. And it sort of starts to set the scene, doesn't it? And as he said to Moses, take off your shoes. The place where you are standing is holy ground. Holy ground is where God is. The earth is the Lord's and the, faun and the fullness there thereof. And so this any idea that we've got God contained in any way, was, it, it, was, it all feeds in to, to, Paul's, to Paul's conversions. He had an objective appearance of the risen, glorified Jesus. It wasn't a vision. He, is, he saw the Lord. And that's in, the, in 9.17, 9.27, 20, Acts 22.14, 26, 16, 1 Corinthians 9.1, 1, 1 Corinthians 15.8. Paul says, I saw the Lord. And so he saw him and it sort of, sort of became a qualification for apostleship, for his type of apostleship, sort of foundational ap apostle. He saw the risen Lord. He was a witness of of the risen Lord. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a vision or as such. And, uh, and, he's, and it also implies that um, in, in, in the 1 Corinthians, when he says he appeared to, and he, he lists all the people, he says, and last of all, he appeared to me as of one born out of time. And that thing, and last of all, he appeared to me, implies that this was going to be the last of this type of appearance of seeing Jesus in, in, in the flesh. So he was convinced. All he needed to know, in a way, a sense, 
was that Jesus was alive and then so much fitted into place that Jesus was the Messiah. He'd raised from the dead. And then we will look about what, 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 what happened, um, what happened uh, late, 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 later on. And so God appeared to him and said, get up and go into the city and you will be told what to do. Isn't it amazing? There's not a single word of rebuke, not a single bit of punishment. Wouldn't you have liked to have said something to Paul? You know. <clears throat> but Jesus, Jesus deals with people so, gr so graciously. And there was none of that. He said, get up, go into the city. It will be told what you must do. One of the things that he said, interesting little things, he says, um, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. And you'll know that the goads are sort of a, a, a prod that are used to move, a, move an oxen uh, it, to keep it moving in, in the right direction. And although when you read Acts 9, it looks like it was all sudden, and there was a suddenness about it, but it's all sudden and just happens out of the blue, actually, God was at work in Paul's life right from the beginning. And there, you, you can have a think through the sort of the possible goads that there were in Paul's, in Paul's life. Paul studied under Gamaliel, when the Christians, then they asked Gamaliel what we should do to these Christians, Gamaliel said, um, uh, he was a teacher of the law who was honoured, this is from Acts 5, a teacher of the law who was honoured by all the people and he stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put out for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men in Israel, listen carefully what you... Consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in, had them flogged, and sent them off. I thought, yeah, it didn't persuade them like totally, did it? <laughs> it was sort of like, uh, he could have gone on to say... <laughs> This man is the Messiah. Put your, put your trust in him. But, but you see, Gamaliel's words, this sort of, the, the, the sort of wisdom inherent in him and, and the words of restraint. Uh, what if that was one of the goads? Because Paul had studied under him. He'd heard his old, his old lecturer coming up with these sort of words. He must have thought, oh, have, have, I, have I got it right? And Stephen, of course, he heard... Um, Saul heard his eloquence, he saw his courage in his face, and all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And then he said, I see heaven open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And Paul would have watched this, he would have seen this young man, and seen how courageously he died, and, and, and heard, and heard what, what he said. And it must have sort of stirred up his doubts. Um, Carl Jung, a Swiss psychiatrist, founder of analytical psychology, says that fanaticism is only found in individuals who are compensating secret doubts. And it sort of implies that he was comp his, his fanaticism was born out of that he had. Perhaps these people are right. Perhaps Jesus, they've, they've said they've seen Jesus risen from the dead. Perhaps he is risen. Perhaps he is. And, and sort of battling those secret doubts. But he also had his conscience, no doubt, caused in a, in a turmoil. He had moral as well as intellectual goads. Because he, was, he, he, was, he could say of himself as touching the law that he, he'd done, he, he, was, he was perfect. But he would have known that in his heart, Things weren't quite right. It says in Romans 7, For I would not have known what coveting really was if the Lord not said, You shall not covet. 
But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. And he was contending with that sort of inner turmoil going on, going on in, in his life. He had in this respect neither power nor peace, yet he would not admit it. And so God broke in upon his life. So we can say of God's grace that it was neither sudden nor was it compulsive. He didn't have no option. God broke into, into his life. He was humbled. But his personality was not violated. Jesus appealed to his conscience and his reason. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So he's engaging in dialogue with him. Who are you, Lord? And he said, and what would you have me to do? So there were counter questions going on in this encounter. So it was a free, rational, conscientious response. Later he would say to Festus, and this is something that nobody has ever accused me of, Festus said to him, Paul, your great learning has driven you mad. <laughs> <laughs> Studying at the London College of Printing doesn't bring out that sort of, <laughs> that sort of response to you. Um, but so he was able to say, what I am saying is true and reasonable. Christianity is true and reasonable. It was not done in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a corner. So Paul had gone from not, being able to, from not being able to see Christianity to being blinded. But now that he was blinded, it, now he could see everything. He could see that 1,500 years of his own history pointed to Jesus. That all the threads of the Jewish law the sacrifices of the temple and everything he had been taught as a child and as a student pointed to Jesus. And that in Jesus everything was fulfilled. Whilst physically he could see nothing, spiritually he could see everything. And there was his fundamental change. And then it goes on. And um, uh, Ananias is sent, to, is sent to him to pray for him. And, um, uh, and it's so interesting that what people need after, when they come to Christ, very quickly they really need a Christian friend. Somebody who can come alongside them, visit them, pray for them, talk to them. So the first words that Paul would have heard from a, from a, in this new state was Brother Saul. Isn't that amazing? And uh, it's just so gracious, it's just so gracious of God. Ananias comes from the name Hananiah, that means the Lord is gracious. gracious. But in his salvation, it's also interesting that he's gone from the extraordinary to the blazing light and seeing Jesus to the seemingly ordinary a visit from a Christian brother. But they're both powerful, and it was powerful in in, in, in the life of Saul and it was, imp and it, and it was important in, in the life of Saul Saul would need individuals Ananias and Barnabas he would also corporately need, need the fellowship of the churches the, uh, the, the, in both in Damascus and, and, and Jerusalem time has really gone but I'd just like to um, just as Perhaps this last, I'm not sure it's going to, if it's going to show on, on here, but there's a song um, by Maverick City, and it, I don't think it's for congregation singing particularly, but it was, uh, it's called My Before and After. And, uh, and this girl, woman, sings of her experience. I'm a picture of your faithfulness. I'm a miracle in process. God, I never would have guessed that you were working in the darkness. Sums up so much of Paul's exper experience. 
And this is my before and after. There's a new light in my eyes. Some, some things a camera can't capture. I was dead, but now I'm alive. You taught my heart to beat again when everything felt lifeless. And you lifted me up from the depths and you gave me back my purpose. This is my before and after. From the ashes you make beautiful things. I know, because you did it in me. It's a, lovely, I, I like, it's a lovely song of sort of thanksgiving to God, what God has done in her life. I thought it was over. I thought it was done. But you always had the last word, and the last word is love. And that's what happened in, in, Paul, in Paul's life. No recriminations for the past. He would sort, he would sort, he would sort that out. Um, as, as, time, as, time, as time went by. But God was at work in, in his life and he changed him. And through Paul's continuing work, he went on and largely changed, changed the world. When he was stood before King Agrippa, he said... He is a chosen vessel of mine to take my name before Gentile kings and people of Israel. Thirty years later, Paul said, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. This is a, such a moving sentence. It is one thing to have a, a, a heavenly vision, quite another thing to be obedient to it. But Paul was. But it was 14 more years before Paul began to be a missionary to the Gentiles. And it may be that you have the, heard the call to be a minister or a missionary, but it may be years before that call is fulfilled. And he calls us to be obedient to the heavenly vision. When you read it in Acts, it all sounds so instant, but um, actually there was like a three-year period in in. In that it says, and many days later, that could be like a three-year, a three-year period where God was dealing, dealing with Paul. But it's such a great story, and it shows a, what a great God we serve, who's so gracious, who deals with us so wisely, and deals with us in the unseen days, as well as in the days that everyone can see. Thank you.